This is called the Discovery Room in Inner Space Cavern. This is the room in which the cave was first discovered. Before we get into the depth of the room, uh, I'll pose the question, is there a preferred orientation to this room? Is there a one dimension of the room that's much larger than the other? Yeah, I, I would say it's kind of in this direction that I'm pointing in. Or to be more specific, say it's like about this direction from where we are to that point right down there. If we follow it out, that's pretty much the long dimension of the room. Okay, so pull out your smartphones or your compasses or otherwise, and let's check the orientation of the long dimension of this room. North 22 East. North 22 East. Okay, that was Travis and Carly got like North 25 to 30 East. Anybody else? What is that number? Is that similar to any other measurement that we've made recently? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty closely corresponding with the orientation of the major faults in the Balcones fault zone in this region. So what that may be telling us is that the faulting is playing a fundamental role in the hydrogeology that's carving the cave, right? If there are major faults, those may start out as our major preferred pathways of flow if we're going to get more flow in that direction, we're going to get more dissolution. Because it's not just enough to have a chemically aggressive solution, i.e. high-end carbonic acid content. We also need a lot of water, right? Because you could have a chemically aggressive solution, but if there's only a small amount of it, it'll only do a certain finite amount of dissolution. If you have these preferred pathways that a lot of water can go through and then add to that geologic time, you can make a pretty big cave like we're seeing here. This is one of the biggest rooms, if not the biggest room in Inner Space Cavern. Those of you who go to Natural Bridge Cavern, you'll see the largest room is um, on the scale of this, and they're also close to the Balcones Fault Zone. There's influence of that there as well. Okay, so what else do you notice is oriented pretty close to the long dimension of the room in this room? Look at the stalactites on the ceiling, right? We're following sort of a fracture that they're lined up along. And then along the floor, it's no, it's no accident that the pathway goes off to the right here because right to the left of the pathway are these honking big fat stalagmites. Look at this guy. Look at that tub right there. There's a really big fat one and there is a gigantic one. And they're all, again, lined up pretty close to the long dimension of the room. So what this is saying is that the tectonic processes that are causing the fracturing in the Edwards formation 17 million years ago during the Miocene period. I think that's ancient history. Actually, it's not. It's dictated the flow pathways of groundwater starting at that time to start carving out the cave. But then it's also dictated the modern groundwater flow to create the orientation of the speleothems that we see, right? So from ancient tectonic processes to modern hydrogeologic processes, there's a fundamental control of the former on the latter. Does that make sense? The tectonic processes and the orientation of the fractures is dictating the modern flow pathways in this system. And it also dictated the ancient flow pathways that carved this cave out to begin with. All right, we're gonna walk along here now and take a closer look at some of these formations. So we're taking CO2 measurements. So that's a good datum for you guys to record in your notes. So we're in the discovery room here, and this particular formation is a giant set of stalagmites that's turned into a flowstone. Right, a stalagmite would just be formed from dripping water and then it spreads out. When you actually have sheets of water moving over a surface, it's called a flowstone. It's, it's deposited from flowing water instead of from dripping water. This is some combination that things flow across the surface, but then you get to this little nub up here. It's right from the drip coming from above. And the tour guides on, in this cave uh, illustrate some of the background of this formation, and they do so by calling this a Buddha eating an ice cream sundae. Right here's the Buddha, kind of fat dude with a knotted hair. There's a little knot at the top of his head, and here's the ice cream sundae. Right? Yeah. You see that? You guys like that as a name? Okay. Buddha eating an ice cream sundae. 
This is a good example to start talking about what does the color of speleothems tell us, if anything. So here it's kind of brown or orangish, kind of the UT burnt orange. Here it's kind of whitish, whitish up here. So before we start talking about what might be causing the color, could you put relative ages on the orange stuff versus the white stuff, knowing how these things form from dripping or flowing water? I mean, I would say that what white stuff here is coming through a little valley in the terrain of orange stuff. And the white stuff here is at the top, it's the youngest stuff. Here it's at the top, it's the youngest. Here it's at the top, it's the youngest. And then stuff is flowing, the white is flowing over the brown. I would put the relative timing here as brown oldest, white youngest, okay, in a relative sense. We could go in and test that idea, that notion with the uranium series isotopes that we do at the University of Texas, that dating method. What might be causing the color of, the, of these formations? Well, so it's the orangish thing that's really giving a color. Calcite might normally be white, but if it has a lot of trace contaminants in it, trace elements in it, it could cause the color to change. So one set of elements are iron and manganese. If they're in there under reducing conditions and then they get oxidized, you could sort of turn them to rust. So iron hydroxides and oxyhydroxides in solid solution with the calcite, manganese oxides and oxyhydroxides, again in solid solution with the calcite, could give it that rust color. But that's not the only thing that might cause coloration in speleothems. Their coloration may change due to the rate at which they're growing and they grow really rapidly. They might incorporate a lot of fluid inclusions. They might get a denser appearance. They have, they're growing slowly and they incorporate less fluid inclusions. It's a more clear appearance that they have to them. Another source of coloration could be components from the soil. Could be organic matter. Basically, right, if you look at soil, it's brown, right? So if you add some brown soil to the white calcite in the simplest minded way of thinking about this, that's another way you could color the speleothems. There could be components of the soil zone. That's where we might expect to get the iron and manganese. Naturally, it doesn't occur in high levels in calcite, but it does in the silicate minerals that make up the soils overlying this terrain. So it's the organic matter and the trace elements and the silicates in the soils above the cave that could be transported down as particulate matter or in solid solutions. The organic matter may break down as organic, humic, and fulvic acids. All of these things could be transported down and then trapped as the calcite lattice is growing. All right. And so we could test these hypotheses by doing geochemical analyses of these. But for now, we're going to keep this in mind that perhaps if, this, if there's this orange, older, white, younger, maybe it's telling us something about the evolution of the landscape above the cave. Something about the soils being more dominant early on in the evolution of this flow system when the bottom parts of these formations are growing. And then as things got younger and younger, maybe the soils had, those components from the soil had less and less of an influence. And I'd like you to ponder what might cause a stronger or weaker influence of soils contributing to the groundwater. Because we're going to see this, we're going to test this hypothesis of this relative age of the orange versus white. We're going to look for this in other parts of the cave and ask the question, is it different everywhere in the cave? Is it the same everywhere in the cave? We always have the same sequence of orange older, white younger, or does it flip around or what? And if it's cave wide, then we might start to think maybe it's even a larger scale than that. Okay, so the reason they call this the discovery room is that the cave was discovered in 1963 by the Texas Highway Department. Uh, someone who worked, the geologist, staff geologist on the highway department was this fellow named Jim Sampson, who I've met, he was a really neat guy. He was the second person to see this cave. The highway departments, they're drilling that overpass for I-35 that we see. It was actually for the railroad overpass uh, that's adjacent to I-35. And they were drilling holes for the support for that structure. Now as they were drilling and drilling, drilling, when you drill and then you enter a void, you have all this force behind the drill bit and then nothing resisting it. And you basically drop your bit or lose your bit. It's a common phrase in the uh, petroleum industry, when you enter a void, you say, we lost our bit, because all of a sudden it doesn't have any resistance to it. So they drilled a hole. This is one of the first ones right here. It's one of their test holes. And they lost their bit. 
Then they wound up drilling another hole down there. There's a series of holes, and they started seeing the dimensions of what was down here. So they knew there was a void. After about six holes, they said, wow, this is not just a void. This is something pretty enormous. They were basically seeing the full length of this thing, and they had no idea what was down here. So then they said, okay, we're going to find out what's down here. So think about it. It's 1963. Um, the way you go into a cave, rather than these battery-powered headlamps, and this thing called a carbide headlamp, it emits a little gas, and you, uh, it's like a little torch on your forehead that you come down into these caves with. And they said, we, what we need to do is get someone down here. So what they did was they drilled a two-foot diameter hole. That's right there until that drill bit was, was dropped. And they said, okay, now we've got it, and now someone could fit in there. And so picture yourself, it's 1963, I know you're kind of young back then, but put yourself back there, and the head of this highway crew says, okay, I need a couple of volunteers to go down there, to go down into that hole, not knowing what lay down here. Knowing also that at one point, this terrain was host to jaguars. Maybe there was a jaguar in the cave. It was really angry because it got lost and wound up in the cave and couldn't get out, and it was really hungry. Who knows what was down here? So who amongst us would have felt like, I'm never going to get this opportunity again. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Put me down here. So not only that, not only facing the complete unknown, but the way they were luring you down through here was you were basically standing on the end of that bit. They pulled the thing back up, said, okay, jump on, hold on to the drill rod, and we're going to lower you down without even a safety rope. Here's actually a picture once they got down here and set up some lights. Here's a picture. Here's Jim Sampson, the second dude in. Here's someone else coming down. Look at Jim Sampson. He's wearing like some straw cowboy hat. <laughs> He's not even wearing a hard hat. And here's just a rope to steady this drill bit coming down. Here's the dude standing on the very end of it. Look at that. He doesn't even have a safety rope tied off around them. Okay, so that's the setting. Who's, who's volunteering for this duty? Really? Oh, okay, so I'd see two out of 10. 20% of the population. I think that's above average, indeed. So that's how they discovered this cave. They came down here, they saw there was this, this enormous room, and they started exploring in different directions, and they mapped it enough by exploring that they knew that there was a, if they had drilled a tunnel, like where they drilled it, they were gonna be able to connect up with the main cave system. Um, I definitely would not have, I've been in a lot of caves, but I've never been in a cave that someone else hasn't been in before. Uh, I really enjoy going into caves, but somehow, I don't know, I don't need, that much excitement, knowing there might be. One cave we went into, uh, it's called Deep Cave in West Texas, and what you could see on some of these formations and rocks are these giant scratch marks of a bear, and there's a skeleton of the bear. So that bear got somehow tumbled its way into the cave and was trapped in there, and apparently it was so angry, it was just like scratching rocks. It was so mad that it couldn't get its way out, it was really hungry. Can you imagine encountering that thing inside a cave? Okay, so now who, who's, who's still volunteering? Okay, great, more people. Why is there a high number of volunteers <laughs> after the bear story? Then, because the bear story was in another cave. Okay, now we're gonna come over here and look at this formation which is called the Flowing Stone of Time. And we wanted to answer the question, how much time is in the Flowing Stone of Time? And, so here we are near the rear of the flowing stone of time, this giant formation. And we have some age information from a core hole drilled right here. And we found that 40 centimeters deep into this core hole, the uranium series method yielded an age of 28,000 years. So from that, if we could determine the diameter of this flowing stone of time, we'd be able to determine using a, an assumption of constant growth rate, just how old it is. And that's what we're puzzling over now. All right, so there's a little pool down here. Normally, before we started the drought of 2011 that we're still in, you'd see sheets of water cascading down the front of this formation, and we'd be sampling it. And now our sampling has stopped because of that. This pool would be filled, not only filled, but it would be overflowing. And we could see it's actually way down as a result of that. So we're seeing the modern day effects of this drought on the growth rates of these things slowing of growth, and 
growth. And so now one of our challenges is, can we reconstruct growth histories of these things that may tell us when there were major droughts in the past? Because here in Texas, we're a very drought prone region of the world. And the projections of climate change into the 21st century is that the changes are going to be even bigger, that we're going to shift into an even more drought prone region than we have been. So if we could see a paleo record of when droughts occurred, we'd be able to know their recurrence interval, driven by natural, non-anthropogenic forces. And that's an important baseline to have if we're going to predict what the anthropogenic influence is going to be on future climate in this region. So now I would say, go ahead and uh, do your pacing. See what you come up with for a diameter. <laughs>